So let's say um, you go on Amazon, you're shopping, right? you look at these two products that are comparable, and uh, and you look at the uh, the star star ratings, right? They 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 rank rate these, um, and so uh, product one. Sometimes you go on Amazon and you feel like the reviews are being faked, so, uh, so it's, it's hard to say, right? Um, our trustworthy sources are not as trustworthy as we like, but let's pretend these were a random samples, okay? Product 1 has uh, 18 reviews and product 2 has 12, and uh, now the average review on product 1 is, uh, is 4.2 stars. of these uh, ratings, and, uh, and you get um, eight over here. The standard deviation is nine. Now that I'm thinking about this example more and more, it might not. Uh, this might not be a good good example, but go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead and make a make a ninety percent confidence interval for the difference in star ratings. You will do all this work, and then I will probably say your conclusions. Do you ever do this when you shop online? No. <laughs> I just look at 4.2 and 4.4 and say 4.4 is higher. <laughs>
Okay, so well let's try this out. So we're going to do y bar 1 minus y bar 2 plus or minus, and I, I, re, um, I was pointed out that I had a mistake uh, on the, the last bit. I had uh, mu's rather than y bar. I, I apologize. T star times the square root. everything with all the numbers I have. So how many degrees of freedom do I have? 20. 28. Okay, n1 plus n2 minus 2. 28 degrees of freedom at 90% confidence gives me 1.701. Do we have evidence that product one has a higher or lower product uh, star rating than product two? No. So we do not have evidence. Star rating. Star ratings of the population, I should say. Right. Okay. Well, that's 
said, this is probably a terrible example now that I think about it. Okay? As I, I just try to come up with something. But now that I think about it, it's probably a terrible example. Why? Because in order for these um, confidence intervals to work, the um, assumptions or conditions for the central limit theorem must apply. Okay? So Select examples? Yeah, so our samples must be selected at random. is just our sample, right? This is the actual reviews, and the population is potentially all reviews, all possible reviews for this product. It, it's a weird concept. So we have a poorly defined sample and our population, and our samples are certainly not random. Okay, so, so the conclusions we make from this are probably not going to be valid. But they still might illustrate that a 0.2 star rating difference may not be a huge deal. Okay. Especially if you only have 8 or 12 reviews total. Okay. If you have something like 500 re reviews, you know, 0.2 star difference could be actually huge or significant. Okay. Is that good? All right. So. Uh, yes, Anthony. So how do you know that the sample size is actually bigger? 
Okay, sample size is not too big. You don't want your sample to be more than 10% of your population. So if you have a finite population, I guess we always do. Um, you don't want your sample to be more than 10% of that. Practically speaking, you don't really run into that problem. Sometimes. Okay, you're overly ambitious. Uh, sample not too small. If the population is normal, no sample is too small. Yeah, so if the population has a nice normal shape, any sample is any sample size is fine. Samples of size two, samples of size six, any sample is fine. If the population is skewed or not normal, you need a bigger sample. Rule of thumb: twenty-five. It's big enough for most circumstances. 25, the rule of thumb, not always. I'm sorry? Yeah, you know, so if it's like only a little bit skewed, sure, you could get away with a sample of size 12. Who knows, all right? It, it all kind of depends. <laughs> the answer is it depends. Always. Yes? How does the sample size say larger, say 25% of the if, if you're sampling without replacement, it, it affects it, okay? So uh, just imagine a deck of cards. Your first card has a 50% chance of being red or black, okay? But after you take out one card, what remains is 25, like let's say the first one was red, and you have 25 red cards and 26 black cards, okay? If you have a small sample, the changes don't really matter too much. But once you start taking out large samples, you can't ignore the effect that it has on the remaining population. So that's why we say the sample should be too big. Okay. Uh, I guess that's assuming you're sampling without replacement, which is most of the time. Okay, so uh, let's switch over to, um, so that this is it for all the material that's going to be covered on the uh, on the midterm exam, okay, so everything up to confidence intervals for a difference between um, means, between populations. Uh, so, uh, we'll review and recap. Uh, topics that you want me to go over in a little bit more depth or review, um, just go ahead and uh, say, do an example of this or, or something. Okay. So on the web page, there is a uh, kind of a list. Topics worth studying, uh, and that covers about, like I said, 90% of what's on the test. There's going to be a few that might not be on there. All right. Okay, so I say finding the mean and median, and uh, drawing a box plot of the IQR, upper and lower fences, you know where the end of the whiskers go, identifying outliers, okay. and along with that, you know, know what Q1 and Q2, Q3, what all of those things are, what they mean. Finding the standard deviation from a list of numbers. Probability tree problems. Based on that, you know, probability of A given B, or B given A. Things, uh, I think we had examples from the quiz, like What's the probability that someone actually has the disease if they test positive? You should be able to identify all of those probability quantities. Uh, if you're given a contingency table or a two-way table, can you calculate um, probabilities based on that? Uh, I don't think we did an example like that in class, but there was examples like that in your homework. Random 
variable problems. Defining, uh, you get a probability table for a random variable. We had to find the mean and standard deviation of those. A binomial model and the normal model. Sampling distributions. Normal approximation to the binomial. And then uh, what we just did in chapter six confidence intervals for one sample, confidence intervals based on two samples. I know I just spewed off a lot of topics. These are all listed on the website. Are there requests for any examples? Yes. I have a question. I have some trouble, like when I read the problem, mm -hmm. I'm like, why do you use like the binomial distribution, okay. normal distribution of the sample? Okay. Yeah. All right. So yes, figuring out what like types of what yeah. what problem is what kind of problem. Okay, that that's very important. Okay. So. I guess, um, so sometimes you just have probability problems. And it might say the probability of some event is this, and the probability of another event is this, you know, what's the probability of this and this? Okay. So you have probability problems. Um, If, you, if you're given conditional probabilities, Somewhere in the problem it says, if this happened, then the probability of this is 30%. Okay, the fact that it says, if this, then the probability is this, that's a conditional probability. If you got a conditional probability, you should probably make a tree. It's certainly not going to be binomial. Binomial examples will never have a conditional probability. do this multiple times, that's probably going to be a binomial problem. Okay. So binomial problems will always have an N, P, and a J. If you can identify those, it's probably binomial.
we find no nil prime. Yes? How can n choose k related to Okay. So, or n choose j or n choose k, um, that just goes in the beginning of a binomial. So if you have n, p, and j, the answer, you know, what is the probability that y equals j is going to be n choose j, p to the j, 1 minus p to the n minus j. Or replace j's with k. So this, the n choose j just goes into the, the formula for finding this probability. Um, if I want you to do a normal approximation, I will state do a normal approximation. But I guess in life, once you use a normal approximation, do a normal approximation if it's going to be too tedious to do a binomial by hand. Okay. So that's usually where n is large and you have multiple j's to figure out. Flip a point 100 times, what's the probability of getting 53 or more heads. So you'd have to figure out j equals 53, j equals 54, all the way up to j equals 100. That's too many, so a normal approximation is well suited. Okay. Don't be shy here. Page 169, problem 5, S9. Okay. It says, uh, the weights at 20 days of age for a uh, population of mice uh, follow approximately a normal distribution. Take many litters of ten mice. Okay. And it says, what percentage of the litters will have a total weight of ninety grams or more?
This is a sampling distribution problem with just a tiny twist. Okay. Here it's saying what percentage of litters, or basically what percentage of samples, so we're taking random samples of 10 mice, will have a total weight of 90 grams or more. In order for the total weight to be 90 grams, what does the average weight have to be? Nine. Nine grams, right? We've got 10 mice. So this is essentially asking the exact same question as what percent of samples distribution, what is our mean? Our mean is going to be 8.3. This is for the uh, sampling distribution. Sampling distribution of what are, okay. And what's the standard deviation of our sampling distribution? 1.7 divided by square root of 10. 1.7 over left all the decimals in, but I get 1.30, a z-score of 1.30. Okay, so I am centered at 8.3, drawing a cutoff at 9.0, which is over there. So I go to my z-table. to use the T here because we know the standard deviation of the oh, population. Okay. okay, so this is known. So we don't use T. Okay. Anytime you don't know the standard deviation of the population, uh, you use S, your standard deviation, as a guess for that. To compensate for that extra uncertainty, we use the t distribution. Anything else? Hi. Yeah. Hi. Um, are there sometimes to find that s that you use the like the binomial equation, and sometimes you use the the one where you have to add up the squares. The binomial one meaning the square root of n times k times one half e. Oh, okay. So finding s. Um, yeah, so for a normal approximation to the binomial, you would use square root of n times p times one minus p. The squaring and the adding up and all of that, that's only if you have a list of numbers. If you're okay. finding the standard deviation for a list of numbers, then you use that standard deviation formula. Okay. If 
if you have a random variable, you find it doing the gradient. So let me just, I'll put this up on the board. Discrete random variable, you do probability of y times, you know, y minus mu squared. And you do that for all of them, you add them up, and you get uh, the variance, and you take the square root of that. You could do the same thing for a binomial random variable, because a binomial random variable is a discrete random variable. But this is rather tedious, so this is a short. And then for a sample, it would be uh, the standard deviation population divided by the square root of the... That's the standard error. Okay. I guess uh, there's a few more. So we have the standard deviation of a sampling distribution. Standard error can be thought of as our estimate for the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. Yes. Oh. So, yeah, 5, 2, 10 is a complicated problem here, okay? So, in 5, 2, 10, they're giving you, there's two things of information that they're giving you, okay? One thing that they're giving you in problem 5, 2, 10 is the mean and standard deviation of the population. 
that comes into play when you're asking about the mean length of a random sample, which is what we have going on in part B of the problem. But also, in the text of 5.2.10, they give you um, a percentage or a probability of some event. And in this case, that event is, is a fish within a certain range? Is the fish between 51 and 60? Or is it not? Okay. So in that case, we basically have a categorical variable. Fit, uh, the, the fish is within this range or it's not. And they said 60 whatever, 66% of the fish are in this, cate fit this category and the rest are not. So that becomes a binomial problem because it's asking what's the probability that four out of four fish are in this category versus they're not. 5210, it's tricky only because they've combined both of those things into one problem. But you get it. And that for that problem, you have to separate out uh, one from the other. So I think at the very beginning of class, or of the course, I said, sometimes we can turn a numeric variable into a categorical variable. Okay? And that's essentially what they did in 5210. They're saying, so the length of a fish is normally a numeric variable, and so it makes sense to do normal distribution, all of that stuff, sampling distribution. But we can also turn a numeric variable into a categorical variable, right? We can take ages and say, are you a, a minor or an adult? Okay? And that's all they did. Is the fish within this range or is it not? They turned it into a categorical variable. When you have a categorical variable, then you can use the binomial distribution. So that one is a tricky problem. Is that good? Everyone's feeling good? Okay. Well, we will uh, end a little bit early today then.